Good afternoon. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. And at the halfway mark, uh, we have uh, the markets doing extremely well. In fact, virtually at the high point of trade with a gain of almost 300 points on the Nifty. The Sensex doing well. It was the Nifty Bank which was underperforming in the first half of trade and now has come back. And that's uh, as a tweet said, because the elephants are dancing. HDFC and HDFC Bank, both of them doing extremely well in today's trading session and contributing to the majority of the gains that we've seen in just the last half an hour or so. Hi, Ekta. Hi, Sonal. Hey, guys. Hi. hi. Uh, of course, we have a lot to discuss, but right now, let's do one thing. Let's start the show by focusing on Deepak Nitride. The stock, remember, was down 10% in trade yesterday. It was a weak quarter for the company, led by the Phenolics division. Their Phenolics habit was down 53% on a year-on-year -year and 45% on a sequential basis. We have Mr. Malik Mehta, who is the CEO and ED of the company, joining us now to discuss more on their quarter two performance. Uh, Mr. Mehta, good afternoon. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot for joining us and specifically wanted to ask about your phenolics division because that has seen a big fall in margins as i said ebit is down both quarter on quarter and on a yy basis what went wrong here um, tell us more about what the macros and the micro specifically for the company looked and the outlook as well unfortunately uh, what i can say is that we have a, a an over muscular quarter facing off with a uh, relatively weak quarter on a year-on-year -year basis, and that makes the difference look even more spectacular. Nonetheless, what I can say is that uh, in quarter two, we had a, a very unique situation, which is not one that normally is seen, where uh, the geopolitical uh, climate in Europe meant that a significant amount of crude all over the world was actually consumed not for uh, as a downstream into the pet chem industry, but as a fuel source for its calorific value. So it was burnt in, uh, in as a replacement fuel for natural gas. And that meant that there was essentially that much less benzene uh, and other pet chems that were made. And whatever was made, therefore, was sold at such a significant premium, while at the same time, phenol, which is largely used as a solvent uh, you're not going to use a solvent. Uh, you're not going to worry about that when you're still busy trying to heat your house, right? So essentially, you saw the price of, uh, you know, BTX, the petrochemicals, skyrocket because of a paucity of uh, crude available for cracking and a drop in the demand for phenol simply because it became a distant second priority. And this is an abnormal situation. Normally, you will find both of these moving in somewhat of a lockstep, maybe with a month's lag. But today, because of the very, very high price of benzene, uh, in the same quarter, we've seen a high and a low, which was about 50% apart in the same quarter. Uh, but this has resulted in tremendous demand destruction, especially when it comes to styrene monomer and uh, MDI and other polyurethanes for a short period of time, which has led to prices of things like benzene and toluene uh, coming down far faster than prices of things like phenol, which were already quite subdued to begin with. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but do you have an outlook in terms of uh, probably the coming quarters, any kind of vis visibility that you have? So you're seeing uh, quarter three, which is at least a little bit better than quarter two. Quarter two had uh, uh, poor demand and supply uh, economics that were there. Nonetheless, all I can say is that whatever we think of as a global slowdown in India, while there was a slowdown, we, we forget that India is a far more interesting growth opportunity than the rest of the world. So slow in India is still fast for the rest of the world. So Domestic consumption was there, slower than normal, more cautious than normal, but it allowed us to manufacture at a rate exceeding 120, 130%, while our nearest neighbors in Korea, Thailand, China, they were operating at rates of 30 and 40%. As far as your uh, advanced intermediary segment is concerned, that did well. Uh, I mean, uh, base, what about the other segments, basic chemicals, fine or specialty? What did well for you? As of October, yes, it is. Uh, what we had in quarter two was a phased startup, which we believe is the safe way of doing things, prioritizing man and material safety over profitability. 
Uh, what we saw in terms of uh, strength was by and large, uh, all of our segments were strong in terms of uh, volume. Now, where there, there were price increases, that was largely on account of significant cost increases that took place, whether it was on uh, caustic, whether that was on ammonia, whether that was, as I mentioned, in relation to benzene, similarly for toluene itself also. So we did see uh, you know, a lot of uh, raw material price movement. Luckily, we were able to, in general, uh, you know, have very understanding customers who were able to accept the price increases. What we did therefore see was on a percentage basis, a contraction in EBITDA, but uh, we maintained and in fact, in many cases, grew our wallet share. In India also, there was a slowdown in the demand in the textile segment where we have a lot of our sodium nitrite and nitrate going. Uh, but we were able to offset this by exporting significant volumes where earlier they would have used Deepak as a second supplier and Europe as a primary supplier. So we were able to get a uh, you know far larger volumes at about the same times as freight rates were normalizing. So by and large, we were able to protect our gross margins slightly at the expense of our percentages, but we are bullish in the overall sense about demand for standalone businesses. Okay, all right. So that is about the advanced intermediates where your India business, of course, is doing better than the global markets. Now let's talk about your CapEx. You have some CapEx lined up. There are three new projects they have been commissioned. One was in October related to agrochemicals, second in November, and third one for the European market. Considering this and the 1500 crore CapEx that has been lined up and you've spoken of as well, what is the growth target, say, two to three years down the line? Uh, what kind of growth are you penciling in here? As we have already... Uh, mentioned that there's about a 1500 crore which is now going to creep up not because of escalation in production but because we're adding new uh, deep bottleneckings and adding new green fields uh, but that will be in the wholly owned subsidiary Deepak uh, Chemtech and there will be a, both an upstream and a downstream uh, uh, investment there over and above this as I have mentioned in a previous uh, con call I think in Q1 we are working on the engineering packages for about three new uh, products which will use uh, uh, very technically challenging uh, gas liquid uh, chemistries, which will be new investments not yet uh, announced in that quantum either. But we will look at them as being about 20 to 22 percent EBITDA over and above the EBITDA that is already made by the existing businesses. And they'll be downstreams, largely uh, with uh, pharma anchor customers and uh, I mean there will be a mix of domestic as well as international customers in these cases so these will be uh, a good value addition as well maybe housed in the uh, subsidiary maybe housed in the primary companies we'll need to see and finally the third leg of uh, investment will be our first international plant which will be in Oman where we will hold a majority stake where the large raw material consumption will be the same product which is also used as an energy source, which is natural gas. And we will be using this and uh, the downstream ammonia into making products such as sodium nitrite and nitrate. And largely because we are very familiar with the end consumers, the end customers, we're confident about the growth. We're also confident about our ability to compete with uh, you know, manufacturers, whether they are in Europe or in uh, China. And uh, we have uh, in Oman at least a pipeline, I think a one or a two kilometer pipeline for feedstock uh, ammonia. And then FTA with countries such as the US, where we will see a significant volume going. And in that sense, it will not uh, step on or cannibalize the market share that Deepak Nitrite in India already has. And this will, over a period of time, start off with being, uh, you know, a two or a three or a four product site, but will become an integrated site, which will house a lot of other products which have chemistries which we're already familiar with. Okay, sure. I uh, just wanted to touch base on uh, developments globally. Is Europe plus one an opportunity? How would you view it? And uh, for the chemical industry as a whole, and uh, what is your take on the impact for your company specifically? So it's all of the above. There is certainly a 
short to medium term trend to look at a Europe plus one. We must also keep in mind that uh, the size of the European chemical industry is not to be underestimated. It is massive. And it is, uh, in that sense, it is uh, the chemical industry that the rest of the world's chemical industry actually supports. Nonetheless, owing to uh, high energy feedstock prices right now, a lot of European customers, uh, a lot of European companies are looking at outsourcing part or all of their uh, you know, targeted uh, production outside of Europe into countries such as India, but not limited to India. However, Europe is also a very large consumer of chemicals and therein there is also an opportunity. So over a period of time, it is, left to be seen whether this is a tactical change or a strategic seismic shift. Today, it looks like a little bit of both, but uh, you know there are a lot of very intelligent people working very hard here. So I think over the next six months, certainly there will be a lot more clarity. It is not the way that one anticipates a China plus one. It is uh, you know one where they are looking at redistributing the cost base. When it comes to China, they're looking at redistributing the strategic risk. So these are different ways of looking at similar problems. And the European problem is one where the European partner themselves is working with uh, a non-European partner to see how to de-risk their supply chain. Whereas in China, it is the demand actually being shifted away from China by the consumer. Okay, we're going to leave it on that note. It's been a pleasure hearing your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's Deepak Knight, right? Uh, that stock is up around 7 tenths of percent, so a bit of a recovery that you'd have to see. But uh, I just want to pull up Zydus Life because that's erstwhile Cadilla that released its numbers just a couple of minutes ago. And overall, uh, yes, the margins have been impacted this quarter simply because of, of, of COVID-related inventory. But what seems to be working this quarter in their favor is the U.S. business which is up around 9% on a Q1Q basis, which is aided by new launches. So that is definitely a positive. The company has also said that the India formulation business is up 11% on a year-on-year -year basis, X of COVID-19. So just a couple of points to keep in mind. That Zydus Life has been quite uh, volatile post its numbers, so the street is really negotiating with whether there are more pluses or minuses at this point in time. Take a short break. On the other side, we have our second corporate on the show. We have Rai which will be discussing their Q2 performance. Stay tuned. <laughs>